<laughs> well, welcome. Nope, you're stuck with me. <laughs> you had two weeks off. You had Jay, you had Todd, and they did a great job. And, and uh, so, <laughs> but now you're back stuck with me. We're, we're in the book of John. We've been studying through the book of John two weeks ago. I guess it's, yeah, about two weeks ago. We stopped in John chapter 5. We didn't get all the way through it, but uh, we're going to do the last part of it today. Um, <laughs> Barbara, I was going to ask you who you got with you. Yeah, I thought I saw a resemblance, but I didn't know how to call out. But hey, Erica. And Penny, who you got over there? Okay, well, welcome. Welcome, guys, folks, ladies. I'm Jesse Walker. Sometimes I preach here. <laughs> Sometimes we have other men that are better than me, and they preach here. <laughs> but but, uh, but I, I'm just glad you're all here. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you came this morning to worship God. We have been working our way through the book of John. We're, we're in John chapter 5. Ricky read you the verses of a, what this text leads into this morning. In John chapter 5, verses 16, 17, and 18. They want to kill Jesus. They picked up knives. <laughs> They were ready to kill him. They were angry that he healed a man on the Sabbath day. They told him he broke the Sabbath. Jesus did not break the Sabbath. He broke their law that they had established. He did not break any law that God had established. He told the man, pick up thy mat and walk. And they said, you can't do that. When they asked the man, <laughs> this is kind of interesting, but when he asked the man, why, why are you carrying your mat? He said, I don't know. The man that healed me told me to do it. I don't even know who he is. Later, Jesus comes across him in the temple and says, stop sinning or it could be worse for you. Sometimes your sins can cause you problems. Sometimes, according to John 9, it's not even you because they came to him and said, who, 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 why is this man blind? Is his mother sin? Did he sin? He says, no, this was because... God's going to use this for his glory. But your sins can cause you problems. And Jesus told that man very clearly, stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. Interesting though in this, so, so what they're mad about him is, is the fact that in 16, 17, and 18, if you look at it is, they say, Jesus, you're claiming to be God. And he says, yes, I am God. No doubt about it. If you ever run into somebody who doesn't believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God or equal with God, you ought to take them to John chapter 5. Let John talk to them. John gives, John gives five clear lessons that we went through the, two weeks ago about why he is equal with God or Jesus does. He says, for one, my father in verse 20 loves me and I can do nothing that my father doesn't send me to do. But me and my father are one, basically, he says. We know in other parts of the text, he says, if you've seen me, you have seen the father. Me and, me and God are one. When his disciples asked him, said, we'd like to see the father. Jesus said, you've seen me, you've seen the father. But he uses that to say the love that me and God have for each other is one reason that I'm equal with God. We are one. We know that John said in John 1.1 1, 1, that in the beginning was the word or, and, in, and the word was with God and was God. That Jesus was from the very beginning. We know from other texts that Jesus said there was nothing ever created that he didn't create. But in this text, Jesus uses this argument. And the other one he gives is that my father gives life in verse 21. And he says, and I give life. Only God can give life. And he argues, I can do that. In this book, in John chapter 9, I think it is, is where he calls out Nicodemus from the dead. He says, Nicodemus, come out. And Nicodemus gets up. We know that Jesus is the one who came out of the grave and walked to earth for 40 days. Jesus can give life. And only God can give life. Verse 22, he said, that all judgment has been given to me. The Father has given judgment to me. And one day everybody will come out of the grave. There will be one resurrection, but there will be two destinations, he says. The good will, will be commended. The bad will be condemned. There will be one resurrection. Everybody will come out of the grave. Or be taken up from this planet if you're still alive. But there will be two destinations, he says. And I'll judge whether or not you've been good or you've been bad. And your determination will be, that, that determination will determine where you will go. John one day looking up in this chapter 3 sees Jesus come and he says, Behold, quoting from Isaiah, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. 
And so he points to this Jesus being who he says he is. And that's what Jesus is going to do today. He is going to call his witnesses. He's going to call basically five witnesses. We're going to look at four. We might talk about five. But we're going to look at the witnesses that Jesus calls to defend himself when you get down here in verse 31. Jesus is going to be like in a courtroom. He's just going to address their questions. How do you do these things? Why do you do these things? How, how do you think you're God? And he says, well, I'll explain it to you in verse 31. He says, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. I don't know if my clicker is here. I'll, I'll bring you up to date where I'm at. So this, this text is all about Jesus. The Bible is all about Jesus. It's one book written with one purpose about one man. And everything you read in this text, you ought to be reading to see Jesus. And in fact, that's going to be one of his arguments when he gets down through here. You have missed the fact that the scriptures have pointed to me over and over and over. But so he's going to call these witnesses. So in 31, so in 31, I, again, I'll read this to you. But he just says, if, he says, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. Now, a little further down here, I'll have it for you. But in Deuteronomy, it says that. In, the, in a court of law, you can't be your own witness. You have to have two or three witnesses in my name. And so that's the law that Jesus... The only reason Jesus is saying, I'm going to bring you some witnesses. He doesn't need them. He's God. He's the son of God. He doesn't, he doesn't have to have... Man doesn't tell God who he is. But Jesus says, I'll play your game. I'll call my witnesses. This is what he's doing. And so he says, there is another one who bears witness of me. And I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. Now, he doesn't tell you who that is in that verse. I personally think he's talking about the Holy Spirit. I think that because if you go over to chapter 1, verse 32, I think he's going to see what he says there. If I get the verse right. Uh, he says, um, and John bore witness saying, I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove and he, he, he remained on him. That's not the exact verse I was looking for, but he, but there's another spot about the spirit. But anyways, I believe you have the triune God here in John. And I think that makes sense because of the fact that everywhere Jesus is, God is and the spirit is. And I think in a way, the spirit is what speaks the word. I think it's the spirit that, that it does and in ways conveys to, to who he's speaking to whether or not they listen or don't listen. And so, uh, just just let you know that, because he doesn't say here clearly. But we'll, So we'll come back. Some think it's the Father. The reason I would argue he's talking about the Spirit and probably not the Father right here is later on he's going to talk about the Father. And I think if he's going to be clear about who the Father is, he would have he just said it here. And so, it, so we'll see that in a minute. Um, but but so, so that's 32. 33 says, you, you have sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. And so, this is John the Baptist. John, John the Apostle is writing the text, but he's going to say, you called, you know about John the Baptist, probably the greatest prophet ever since the closure of the Bible is what he's saying. And John come and he testified of me. And they knew of John. They trusted John. They believed John was one of them. In fact, in chapter 1, thousands are going out to John and getting baptized in the River Jordan. And he says, you believed what John had to say for a while. And then all of a sudden you didn't believe anymore. And so I want you, but he, so that's what he's saying. And we're, again, we're going to end. He says, "Yet I do not. This, I don't receive testimony from man, but I, but I say these things that you may be saved." He was so, so. So get that too as we go through this text. Jesus is doing what he's doing because he wants all mankind to be saved. Jesus is calling his witnesses so that when he's done, there can be no doubt that he is the Son of God. There can be no doubt that he did what he did in order to save mankind. That's the question I would ask you this morning. Are you any different than them? Do you listen? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Have you changed your life? Will you commit to that? Because Jesus says, I'm doing this so you will know. And he's going to call his witness. He said, John the Baptist is going to bear the truth about me. But if you don't believe it, you're no different than these Jewish leaders this day. And you'll be lost in your sins. It isn't just a textual lesson to say, get the head knowledge all you can get and mark it off. It's to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and to be changed. To walk a new life. To be a different person. James said, you show me a man with faith, I'll show you a man with work. James says, if you're a child of God, your lifestyle will reflect the fact that you're a child of God. And Jesus is teaching these people and he says, you know about John the Baptist. Oh, you have faith in John the Baptist. And you believed him for a while. 
until he said, I must decrease in order that he must increase. John said, I'm not even fit to tie the sandals of his shoes. John said, I come to tell you about the one who come before me. And Jesus was born after John. But he says that because Jesus was always eternal. And John goes on and on with his witness about Jesus Christ. Behold, the Lamb of God who comes and takes away the sins of the world. And he points to Jesus. And he points to Jesus. And John, Jesus says to them, you missed it. The one prophet that came 400 years after silence of the Bible. The one who came preaching repentance is the one who pointed to me. And you didn't accept it. And so he gets down to 35. He was the burning and shining lamp. And you were willing for a time to rejoice in his light. Many believe at this time John has probably died. He's probably been beheaded. And Jesus sees him as his, a light that comes for a while and burns out. All lamps burn out. John's lamp will burn out. Your lamp will burn out. You are not going to live forever on this earth. Some of us have less time than others. The substance that you're burning in your lamp is given to you by God. But there will be a day that that lamp will die out. John's lamp died out. He was a mortal man. Preaching about Jesus Christ. Someday I will die out. And you will too. Jesus said, but when that light was burning, you liked it. Chapter 1, if you, if you went back to chapter 1, again, see if I can find it. Uh, that, uh, 27 is about the sandal. Over, over in verse 7 says, this is the man that came from a witness to bear witness. He's talking about John of the light that, that all, though through him might, all through him might believe. He was not that light. So he said, John's not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. So he says, John's lamp, light, whatever you want to call it, was not the true lamp, light. I'm the true light. John pointed to me, he says. I'm the light that can give life. And you missed it. So 36 says, but I have a greater witness that, than John for the works which the Father has given me to finish. The very works that I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. Jesus says, my life points to who I am. And we'll get into some of this. But Jesus says, I walked on water. I called Nicodemus out of a grave. I told a woman at the well all of her past. I took the nobleman's son who I'd never seen. And I said, he's, he's going to be healed. Just go home. He's fine. I took the lame man that laid there for 38 years and couldn't walk. I said, get up, pick up your mat and walk. He said, my work speak of me. You can see who I am because of what I've done. Can you walk on water and tell the wind to be quiet and it stops? He says, I doubt it. I can prove to you that I am the son of God because one John the Baptist came and preached about me and said, I'm the one in the wilderness that was, that was coming where he came from the wilderness. But he quoted Isaiah and said, this is the one. And then he said, you ought to look at my life and see the miracles that I have performed. Can you do what I do? Can you walk on water? Can you raise the dead? Can you feed the multitudes with two fish and five loaves? John picked seven miracles to show who Jesus Christ was. Jesus did so many miracles. John said you couldn't even write them all down. The books couldn't contain them. The world couldn't hold them. But these were written that you may know. Don't leave here this morning and not know. He said you can know who the Son of God is. And Jesus says don't take my word for it. <laughs> Although that would be a pretty good word. <laughs> he said I'll call all my witnesses in for you. I'll call in John the Baptist. I'll call in my works. I'll call in my father. How many do you need? When will enough be enough? When will you believe? And so he says, the works which the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do bear witness of me, that the Father has sent me, and the Father himself who sent me has testified to me. You have never heard this voice at any time, nor seen his form, but you do not have his word abiding in you because whom he sent him you do not believe. That's the problem. The problem isn't Jesus. The problem isn't the works. The problem is some choose to believe and some choose not to believe. But he said, he said that the Father testifies of me. I like to think about when Jesus was baptized. 
because you have the dove coming down like a dove, the spirit coming down and descending on him. And then you have the father saying, now John doesn't give you this, Matthew does. And the other apostles says, and then there was a voice that said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. And the multitude heard him. God, God spoke it loud and clear. This is my son. And Jesus said, you can know who I am because of what my father said. You can know who I am because of the works of what I did. You can know who I am because of other witnesses like John the Baptist who said, yeah, I've done this. Jesus walked to earth 40 days after he was resurrected. I mean, when he came out of the grave, there were many witnesses that saw Jesus Christ after his crucifixion. Jesus is only using these four or five in the courtroom, but he said, you know. <laughs> I could, <laughs> he would, if you were in a courtroom, I, I remember this when I was in a car accident one time. <laughs> so I, I was in a car accident. I hit this car in front of me. It was really, she pulled out of her driveway, didn't look. And when I walked up to the door, I thought I had killed this woman. <laughs> All this happened so fast. My car's not running. The radiator was pushed in. And so I finally get out of my car. I get to her car. She's got a big neck brace on. Her eyes are all black and blue. And I'm thinking, wow, I killed this person. <laughs> and she looks at me. She says, no, I was in a car accident a week before. And I was told not to drive because I can't turn my head left to right. <laughs> think, well, that could be a problem. But the funny part was there was a gentleman sitting over on the sidewalk in the city to come out. And he was drunk. He could barely walk. And he said, I saw the whole thing. I'll tell them for you. <laughs> I'm like, uh, please go back to the sidewalk. I don't think you're going to help me. You see, if you're in a courtroom and you call a bunch of witnesses, you don't want the prosecutor to tear your witnesses apart and say, well, that's not a very good witness. Jesus calls John the Baptist, who he said in Matthew was the greatest man ever born of a woman and in case you don't know it that's all of us because you're only born of a woman now i know our society seems to be getting a little confused but the truth is you're born of a woman and only a woman and jesus said there is no one greater than john the baptist so he calls this greatest man that ever was zachariah his father who was a priest his mother elizabeth who couldn't give birth gives birth later in life when when she's blessed by god because she was barren Zachariah, you might remember, can't even speak for nine months because he kind of laughed about, no, you ain't getting pregnant, honey. You're way past getting pregnant. <laughs> that might have been the greatest nine months of their marriage. <laughs> Zachariah couldn't, right, Bobby? Might be the best nine months of our marriage if I couldn't talk. <laughs> no trash talking on a pickle cord. I wouldn't be able to do it. <laughs> it's an awesome thing he calls John the Baptist. He's a Nazarite, takes a Nazarene vow, doesn't cut his hair, doesn't drink, comes out of the, comes out of the desert in, a, in camel hair and eating locusts and honey. Oh, they knew John the Baptist. And they knew him well. And they believed what John had to say. And Jesus puts him on the, on the stand and says, this, this guy here, he, he'll, he'll back up my story. Then he puts his father on the stand. <laughs> when you like to be able to call God at your trial, Lord, I'd like you to come in here and just tell these people that I'm innocent. <laughs> Pretty good witness. I don't know if you can get any better. And then in the that, he says, well, look at my works. I mean, I walk on water. Anybody in this courtroom walk on water? Let's go ahead. We'll just put a little pool in here. We'll see who can, we'll just tread around a while, see who can, who can last the longest walking on top of water. How about this? Let's just go down to the cemetery. We'll drag out some dead bodies and I'll call them to life. Let's see if you can. And Jesus says, I'm, I am who I am. And I can prove it by my works. The question is, will you believe it? What does God have to do to change your life? What miracle are you waiting for God to perform in your life? He gave his son for you. Is that enough? You have, there's another witness he calls here, we'll get into it. He says, you search the scriptures for in them, this is really where I wanted to hang a few minutes. You search the scriptures for in them, you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. You have the scriptures. He's going to go on here, let's just read down. He says, but you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. I do not receive honor from men, but I know that you... That you do not have the love of God in you. I have come in my Father's name and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. Basically there he's just saying, you, you believe what your friends are saying. But you don't believe the Son of God. You buy all the lies out here in the world. You buy all the other false teachings. But you don't want to listen to me. 
He says, how can you believe you receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes from the only God? Do not, do not think that I accuse, the fa- accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, and in whom you trust. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Okay, so I want you to think about this a minute. First he says in this verse, he says, you search the scriptures uh, for them and you think you will have eternal life. And these are which testify of me. Do you search the scriptures? He says, he says in that other verse we read about Moses. He says, Moses is going to be the one that, that testifies against you all. Now, if you're a Hebrew, you knew Moses. He was the lawgiver. He's the one who brought him out of Egypt. He's the one who carried the tablets down off the mountain. You didn't talk bad about Moses. That was a jaw dropping. I want you to know something. This argument that Jesus is making is not is not a polite argument. When I say polite, he's hammering them. You think you know the scriptures. You Jews can quote the Pentateuch from Matthew, Mark, I'm sorry, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. You know all five books forward and backwards because you have to to be a part of this and part of this Jewish leadership you're in. You knew them when you were probably 12 years old. You wrote them on your forehead. You wrote them on your houses. You put them on your clothing, your tassels. You can quote the scriptures, but you can't find Jesus in the scriptures. And we read the same way sometimes. We read the Bible to figure out why we're right and why they're wrong. We read the Bible to prove ourselves. I'm going to read my text so I can prove my brother down the road is wrong. Never looking for Jesus. Just looking to prove that I'm so good at deciphering the text. We read the text so that we can say it's two prayers. We read the text to do anything and everything but to find Jesus. This is what he teaches. The possibility is, what Jesus says is, you can read your text and never find me. How can that be? The book is all about Jesus. And we sit down and read and try to figure out why I, can, I don't like my neighbor. And I'm going to read the text. And I'm going to find out in here how I can curse down my neighbor. I'm going to read the text that says, if my neighbor is just bad, oh Lord, I hope you come and crush their teeth. I hope you bash their head. I hope you find a way to get them, get them off my property, Lord. I hope you just teach me. And I read the Bible in order to feel what I want. I don't like my wife, Lord, so I'm trying to find an excuse. How can I get divorced? I read the text in order to prove myself that I'm doing right. That's what these brethren did. I say brethren, that's what these Hebrew men did. They read the text and never found Jesus in any of the texts. How can you do that when the book is all about Jesus? Because you read for a purpose. You read for an intent. You read to get what you want. I read because, oh, I got my daily Bible reading. I read because somebody's going to ask me, did I read? I read. I want you to read because in this you will find Jesus. And only in this will you find Jesus. It It isn't a grade you get. And as holy as these words are, given by the Holy Spirit, these words will not save you. You will be saved because of your faith in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. You can memorize from Genesis to Revelation. If you don't find Jesus, you will not go to heaven. The text is given to you to reveal to you the Son of God. Not your likes, not your dislikes, not your style. And Jesus looked at these men and said, oh, you know the scriptures. You know them well. Yet, you refuse to believe. You know the Bible? You can quote the Bible? How can you believe? I want you to think about this with Moses. He says Moses is going to be the one... That accuses you. Again, it goes back to the idea that I don't have to accuse you. Your leader, per se, the one that brought you up out of Egypt, the one that brought you the tablets, the one that wrote the first five books, because all they had was the Old Testament. You know, that's another interesting point. (laughs) All they had was this Old Testament. You have the new and the old. We got less excuse than they do. 
There was a, I, I wanted to, let me get to, I want to show you something that I think is very interesting. So these are the points, I just, I just did them. But <laughs> I want to get to this uh, guy that I was watching. So, well, well, Jesus points to his miraculous works. You can, again, these are the ones that he did. He, took, he walked on water, he heals the Samaritan woman, the nobleman's son, the pool of Bethsaida, the, you know, by, by the sheep gate where the guy can't walk, the woman and her children. Uh, what is that? Well, that's when he feeds the 5,000, he walks on the water, you got the blind man, you got Lazarus, and you got, you got the miraculous catch of fish. This is all in John. But there's many, many more miracles Jesus did. But John picks these ones to show you that he must be the son of God, that he must be God. Uh, he points to his father who sent him. These are all, uh, you know, the voice from heaven. Uh, he points to scriptures. I want, you know, you, you could read. This is where I want to go with this. And then I'm going to close with it. But I want you to see this. There, some some, some um, scholars would say somewhere between 300 and 500 different prophecies Jesus fulfilled. Don't know the exact number. But that's, even if you would dwindle it down, just say you dwindle it down to 100. This book was written thousands of years before Jesus ever came on the scene. And those guys that wrote, that didn't know Jesus, wrote, pointed to Jesus. And, and, and so I want you to see this because there's a guy, he's a, he's a sign. These are all where Jesus, he actually, this is, I was going to quote to you from Isaiah. Isaiah is the one that says, from the very beginning, from the beginning of time, before time, before the end of time, God proclaimed who Jesus Christ was going to be. So he, he, so God says, I could tell you, I could tell you before it ever started, I could tell you how it's going to end. You know any other gods that could do that? That's the argument he's making with them in Isaiah. And I quoted about three different, I was going to quote you those three different scriptures. But what, but, 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 but what he's doing is saying, if you can find a God like that, go ahead. But you ain't going to find no God like that. There's no God out here that you worship that's going to tell you everything from the very beginning, from the starting of time until the end of the world. But this is, this is this Professor Stoner, I wanted to quote this to you. So P Professor Stoner, he's this chairman at this Department of Mathematics and Ast Astronomy in, in, in Pasadena City College and, and the chairman of the Science Division of West, Westmount College. So what he does, so he's a, he's a mathematician. So he says, okay, I'm going to figure out if Jesus could fulfill eight of these prophecies. So there's, again, don't forget, there's 300 to 500 different prophecies. But he says, I wonder, I wonder if I could prove that Jesus just filled eight of them. I'm going to take the most eight simple prophecies in the Bible. Something like, well, he's going to be born in Bethlehem. Yep. We know of Jesus that was born in Bethlehem. Oh, we're going to take a guy that, you know, we, we say we're going to do this. Do, oh, there's going to be a king that's going to uh, put an edict out to kill every child. Yeah, yeah, we can pretty much see that in the Bible. So he takes the most eight simplest prophecies and says, we're going to prove that Jesus, if he had done this, what would be the odds? And he gives you that 10 to the 17th. And that's the number there. I don't know how to read it. <laughs> What he says is in his book, if you read it, he says, that's like taking silver dollars, putting them in Texas, all across the state of Texas, two inches deep, taking Roman and blindfolding him and saying, Roman, I'm going to drive you anywhere across the state. I've taken one of those silver dollars. I've marked it with a red dot. You just tell me when to stop. I'll stop in Texas. You, you ever drive across Texas? Oh, yeah. Pretty long state. <laughs> I'm just going to drive. When you tell me to stop, I'll stop. You get out of the car, reach down into those silver dollars and see if you can find that one silver dollar that I marked with a red dot. He says that's the odds that Jesus would have fulfilled just eight of the prophecies and yet he fulfilled them. He says in his book, he says, if he had fulfilled 48 of them, there would have been so many silver dollars, they could, the earth couldn't hold them. You'd have to take them into space. I'd put Roman in the spaceship. I'd blindfold them. I'd fly them up there and I'd say, now Roman, when you tell me to stop, I'm going to throw you out. And you go find that silver dollar out there with that one little red dot on it. And the odds are that, you know, you'll be able to fulfill it. And that's like 10 to the 157th. Actually, whoops, sorry. I actually had that in here somewhere. <laughs> so I don't know how to write 10 to the 157th. It would not fit on the screen. But Jesus fulfilled the prophecies that the odds of that are so, it couldn't be done unless you're God. Is what I'm trying to get you to see. And other scientists have looked at his work and said, as a mathematician, he is spot on. If Jesus did just eight of those, the odds are, the odds are even worse than you winning the super Powerball. I actually looked that up. If you were to win the greatest Powerball that ever was, it was like 10 to the 48th. <laughs> and you know what the odds are of you winning that, right? Well, guess what the odds were at 10, at 10 to, to 148 or 152, whatever that says up there. I can't see it. It's a lot. But yet God fulfilled those prophecies. So here I'm going to conclude my lesson to you. Jesus presented his witnesses. 
and they were good to prove that he was the son of God in order that you could be saved if he just filled eight of those prophecies you can't deny the fact that he's the son of God because you're not going to drive across Texas and find that coin and you're not going to fly into space and get out there and find that coin only God can do that. So I don't, I don't know where you are this morning. I, I wanted to say something to some of you young folks. You know, when I was young, I, I, I followed my father and my mother and did what they asked me to do. <laughs> right? But one day you're going to find out in the church, you're going to have to have your own faith. And I, I don't know where you are. I don't know if you're, I don't know if you're still living off what mom and dad taught you. I'm not talking these little ones. I'm talking some of you there. 10s, 20s, 30-year-olders in here. I'm so proud of the young folks that are coming. But, and I'm sure a lot of you have learned this already, but one day your faith will have to be your faith. You won't be able to live off what mom and dad did for you. In fact, in, in the sense of your relationship with Jesus. You'll have to answer the questions, who is Jesus? And what does that mean to me? Jesus presented his witnesses. He's given you the evidence of who he is. The question is, will you believe it? Because if you don't, you're no different than these Jewish men. And you can study the scriptures and miss Jesus. Don't study the scriptures and miss Jesus. So if you're here this morning, we're going to stand. We're going to sing. That's our tradition. We'll sing a song. It's an opportunity for you to come and just... Let us know what is on your mind. If you want to find more out about Jesus, you want to become a child of God, you want to, you, you want to ask about baptism, anything you want to talk about, we're here to help you with that. Logan's going to lead us. There's a fountain free to His